Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. Today we're going to talk about big tech giants, and in fact, the very big tech giant on which I am producing this video. That's right, we're going to be talking about Google and YouTube today. Now, a little while back, I did a video entitled Bad Optics, and I called it some of the worst terms of service that I had ever seen. This video was about Facebook and their Oculus product and the problems that came out of tying someone's Facebook presence, however they are managing the content on that service, with a piece of hardware that they had purchased separately. Meaning that if Facebook somehow found fault with something that a user of an Oculus headset had written on their social media posts, then they would lose effectively all access to this multi-hundred dollar piece of hardware that they had purchased. Now, in my opinion, that's still the worst thing that I have seen in terms of the combination of social media and big tech giant and the hardware that they produce. But today we're gonna be talking about a very similar concept. The problems that arise from the marriage of something like user-generated content delivery services like we see on YouTube and the other premium products that they wish to sell you. Today, just a few hours ago on Twitter, a Twitter user by the name of Artemis Wolf tweeted at Team YouTube, the main YouTube social media contact, the following. Why am I still being charged for premium on a YouTube account I can't access? I can't even go to the proper page to cancel it. I demand a refund and a canceled membership. To which Team YouTube responds, and they often do. It's actually one of the best ways to communicate directly with YouTube, which is perhaps its own message. We recommend requesting a refund through here, and they provide a link. Also, you can try canceling your premium membership by following the outline steps in this article. Reach back out if needed. And they provide these links that are pretty normal for YouTube to do. It's a request, a refund page, YouTube help, help center. You want to hit the request a refund button, et cetera, et cetera. The problem as we will find, is that when you go and hit that request a refund button, you see that the first step is that you need to make sure you're signed into the account you use to make the purchase that you need help with. And it's similar for the other links that talk about canceling, pausing, resuming your membership. YouTube provided the generic kind of response to this particular user, and the user had a bigger issue. The user, Artemis Wolf, continues, neither page works for me. I keep getting this error. And that error reads as follows unable to access a Google product. If you've been redirected to this page from a particular product, it means that your access to this product has been suspended. Read on for more information. Your access to this Google product has been suspended because of a perceived violation of either the Google Terms of Service or product-specific Terms of Service. Now, just stepping back for a second in terms of messaging that YouTube does here, there is absolutely no reason for the word perceived to be there. That is some kind of lawyer legal ease from their own internal legal department trying to protect them from claims of unwarranted suspensions or what have you. But if they are taking the action to prevent you from accessing something on their service, it better be more than a perceived violation. You don't admit if you're Google or YouTube to only perceiving something that might be wrong when it isn't in fact wrong. That's kind of a side note here. But continuing with the statement, for specific product guidelines, please visit the homepage of each Google product you're interested in for a link to its terms of service. Google reserves the right to disable an account for investigation, suspend a Google account user from accessing a particular product or the entire Google account system if the terms of service or product specific pol policies are violated, terminate an account at any time for any reason with or without notice, and the next steps for you, or if you believe your access to this product was suspended in error, get in touch with us. That's not actually included in the image that this Twitter user provides, but Hey, I've seen this message before as we've talked about in this space. Now, if you are immediately kind of suspicious of this entire communication, wait for YouTube's follow-up here, which is, if the channel's suspended, you'll have to resolve it before you can cancel YouTube Premium. More details here at this link. Tweet back at us if needed. So here is YouTube out there in the world saying, you pay for a premium service. It's set up for automatic renewals. I can't cancel it. I demand a refund and a canceled membership, says this user. We, YouTube, can unilaterally terminate your account and access to the credit card and account information you've provided to us to renew this service. And if you can't fix it, we can keep charging you money despite the fact that you no longer have access to the product or service, which we are purportedly giving to you 
in exchange for that money that you have provided to us. Anyone, even without a law degree, can look at that and say, my goodness, that's wrong. Now, this person might be well deserving of their suspension. This isn't a conversation about bad people online. They, of course, might be completely innocent and YouTube just decided to wield the ban hammer for whatever reason they deigned appropriate. The point is, if you are suspended and YouTube is no longer providing that access, there is no way on God's green earth they should continue collecting money for a service they are not providing. But they wrote their contracts in a pretty specific way, or more specifically, in a pretty ambiguous way that prevents most easy arguments against them. But we've still got a few here in virtual legality. Here's the YouTube premium page. This is the product that the Twitter user has named. YouTube and YouTube Music, ad-free, offline, and in the background. We've got free trials. It's $12 a month. You can click on the terms of service that will lead you to the YouTube paid service terms of service, which, hey, maybe isn't the best title for a document that you're trying to make somewhat accessible to people that are using it. Anytime you have to repeat a word within four or five words of your headline, maybe not the greatest idea in the world. But as we will see here, it doesn't include some of the provisions we would ordinarily observe in a normal contract negotiated between commercial entities. So let's start. YouTube allows you to access certain premium features or content in exchange for a one-time or recurring fee as applicable to the relevant features or content. We're talking about a recurring free here, as least as described on the Twitter. The paid services include YouTube rentals and purchases, paid channel subscriptions, feature-based subscriptions, and other YouTube services which may be offered by YouTube in the future. And they use this defined term, capital P, paid, capital S services, throughout this document to refer to things like YouTube premium. We continue on, you accept, we're going to provide these things, and you pay. If you purchase any automatically renewing subscriptions, you agree that YouTube will charge the payment method on file on the first day of each billing period for the relevant subscription. So that's the main obligation of the subscriber here. Hey, I want some YouTube premium. We've highlighted it in the contract. If you purchase an automatically renewing subscription, you give us permission to charge your credit card every month. And that makes sense. That's how renewing subscriptions work. We continue on, however, because some people might want refunds. Some people might not be happy with the product they offered. Well, for the most part, YouTube says if you ask for it within seven days and you didn't really use it, we can give you a refund. But we reserve the right to approve or deny refund requests after seven working days at our sole discretion, except where the paid service is defective. Now, I think there's a fair argument to be said that if I can't access the quote unquote paid service, you don't have any right to the money. And so it's defective, at least as far as I'm concerned as a subscriber. But these are the kinds of somewhat attenuated arguments you'd actually have to make in this document because there isn't the obvious paragraph that says, hey, if we terminate your butt off our channel, if we kill your account, we're not going to keep charging you money for a service we don't provide. YouTube just forgot to include a paragraph like that. And then we get to subscription cancellations. Here's another area, a little bit attenuated, where you might be able to find some success with an argument against YouTube based solely on the four corners of the contract document. If you purchase a subscription to a paid service that automatically renews, you may cancel the subscription anytime before the end of the current billing period and the cancellation will take effect on the next billing period. Now that's as close as I can come to a silver bullet against YouTube in the contract itself. This is a sentence that says you can cancel any time when on Twitter they have instead replied, if you're suspended, you'll have to figure that out. And remember, figuring out a channel suspension on YouTube is almost entirely within their power. And what the law abhors is a situation like this one that we're going to get back to when we talk about equitable principles towards the end of this video. But that situation is where one side of a commercial transaction, one contract party can say, hmm, I can use some of the terms that from YouTube's perspective, I wrote to collect money and not even provide the service. Remember, as we've talked about in this space, suspending a channel, very arbitrary. YouTube has taken great lengths to actually put forth in their terms of service, we can do whatever we like. We're going to take a look at that in just a second. And if they have that authority, and if this were allowed for them to just claim this money after you've been suspended and they already have your renewal set up, then... Well, frankly, they'd be making a lot of money that they didn't earn. The law really doesn't like that, no matter what you put in your YouTube premium terms of service. Now, 
I have a couple of other things to mention from this particular document. One, on the paid service license side, they kind of mirror the terms they use for YouTube generally. They say, if YouTube reasonably determines that you violated any of the terms and conditions of the paid service terms, the document we're looking at, your rights under this section four will immediately terminate and YouTube may terminate your access to the paid service and you or your YouTube account without notice and without refund to you. Now, this is ostensibly the license that you are getting for these and you're not receiving them when you are otherwise suspended. So here is another area where if you were arguing this before the court, you would say, your honor, they're not providing the service that they are claiming I'm paying for. It cannot be the case that they collect months of my money for not providing me with anything. Finally, I wanted to leave you with, unless not permitted by applicable law, you acknowledge and agree that these paid service terms, your transaction for the paid service and your relationship with YouTube under these paid service terms shall be governed by the laws of the state of California. And this is also mirrored in their generalized terms of service, which they incorporate by reference in this document, which is why we're going to look at them in just a minute. But keep that in mind. YouTube, if it has its druthers, wants to talk about all of this under California law. And California is an unusual jurisdiction in all sorts of ways, but in this particular way about renewing subscriptions. We'll get to that in just a second. Now, we've looked at the terms of service document a lot here in virtual legality. The important part here is that they reserve the right to terminate you for basically any reason. YouTube reserves the right to suspend or terminate your Google account or your access to all or part of the service if you materially or repeatedly breach this agreement. Note that that says Google account. By the way, much like we talked about with respect to the Oculus and Facebook, if YouTube determines that you said something that they didn't like or that you infringed a copyright, regardless of whether or not you did, and they get to a place where they are terminating your Google account, you could lose access to all sorts of Google things that you are using right now. If you take anything from this video, take that. You need to be fully aware of the network of various services and products that you're using and how interaction with any of the user content generation features of these things, comments to YouTube videos, posts on Facebook, whatever they might be, can interact with the rest of their family of entities, right? If you say something on this virtual legality video, you say, Rick, you suck. And now I'm going to get 16 comments that say that. So I appreciate it in advance. And Google decides that that's too much. Then maybe you lose access to Gmail. Maybe you lose access to Google Meet. I don't know. You might lose access to something that's very important to you, your livelihood and the way you run your business because you said something nasty online. And that to me is a heck of a risk. And I don't think people are aware of that exposure enough. Because when YouTube actually talks about what they mean in these contracts, they say, hey, we can terminate you. We can suspend you. And what's the effect? Well, ordinarily, you'd say something here that says, hey, if you're paying for stuff, that goes away, but we don't have to provide it to you anymore, et cetera, et cetera. Instead, this paragraph only says, if your Google account is terminated or your access to the service is restricted, you may continue using certain aspects of the service, such as viewing only without an account. You can still access our website without logging in, and this will still apply to you in case you start causing trouble in some way that we can't anticipate. It doesn't actually talk about anything that might otherwise happen to your renewed accounts or anything. And the paid service terms don't either. Now we do get the reference again to California law. YouTube, if it has its druthers, wants to look at these things under California law. And so we will as well. Now it's important to note when we look at these tweets, we don't know where Artemis Wolf is located. We do, however, know that YouTube would like to adjudicate all of its claims under California law. So we can at least use that as a baseline. And what a baseline it is. Because as of November of 2021, just a few months ago, we actually get the California Assembly passing a brand new version of an existing automatic renewal law that will go into effect this summer. It's not in effect right now, but will do things such as under the amended law, users who sign up online must be able to cancel their subscription immediately and at will by either a direct link or button on the website or a pre-formatted email that the consumer can send without adding additional information. You can just send it back. We don't care what your automated system is. In California, we want to protect people from online abuse of this nature. Now, it is worth noting that if the individual isn't in California, this probably won't apply. We see that referenced in a couple of places. It shall be unlawful for any business that makes an automatic renewal offer or continuous service offer to a consumer in this state to do any of the following. You're not allowed to fail to present the automatic renewal offer terms or continuous service offer terms in a clear and conspicuous manner. 
You're not allowed to charge the consumer's credit or debit card or the consumer's account with a third party for an automatic renewal or continuous service without first obtaining the consumer's affirmative consent to the agreement. They have to know it's being a renewed service and they have to agree to it affirmatively. You're not allowed to fail to provide an acknowledgement that includes the automatic renewal offer terms or continuous service offer terms, cancellation policy, and information regarding how to cancel in a manner that is capable of being retained by the consumer. You can't submit it in some kind of document that, oh, I don't know, they would lose access to if something happened to them and their account. And a business that makes an automatic renewal offer or continuous service offer shall provide a toll-free telephone number, electronic mail address, a postal address if the seller directly bills the consumer, or it shall provide another cost-effective, timely, and easy-to-use mechanism for cancellation. In addition to the requirements above, a consumer who accepts an automatic renewal or continuous service offer online shall be allowed to terminate the automatic renewal or continuous service exclusively online, which may include a termination email formatted and provided by the business that a consumer can send to the business without additional information. That's the existing law. This is in effect until July 1st, 2022, as of the date that is repealed. And then it gets harder, right? You you can't fail to provide a consumer with a notice as may be required that clearly and conspicuously states all the following, one or more methods by which a consumer can cancel the automatic renewal or continuous service. A business that makes an automatic renewal offer of continuous service offer shall provide that toll-free number and everything else that we just talked about. If this person lives in California, it is already clear that YouTube can't just hide behind some kind of suspension action in order to continue collecting renewal dollars, regardless of everything else we've talked about, regardless of the obvious unfairness and injustice of just taking money and not providing a product or service. Now, I can give YouTube the benefit of the doubt that tying all these things together is some kind of logistical quagmire, that the easiest way to handle support tickets and everything else is by having them related to the account. But with this particular issue, you cannot operate this way. Now, it's worth noting, as I said, that the jurisdiction is going to matter. I'm going to include in the description to this video a summary of various of the state laws that have been considered, but we do see a lot of jurisdictions that cover this kind of ground and a number of them that don't. We have reference to that California law that I just referenced. We have reference to things like Colorado laws, Connecticut laws, other places that may or may not actually control over this relationship with this individual on Twitter. But I used California because I think it's fair to use California against YouTube, which otherwise asks for California law to govern the relationship that it has with its users. It's also worth noting that they don't really say this clearly and conspicuously anywhere, right? What happens on a channel or account termination according to YouTube? If your channel or account is terminated, you may be unable to use, own, or create any other YouTube channels or accounts. Fair enough. When a channel is terminated, the channel owner gets an email explaining the reason for the termination. But if the reason for the termination is something like a suspension for comments on YouTube or putting up videos that were copyright infringement or anything like that, it's very difficult to see the nexus between that activity, which may be admittedly bad or illegal or cause problems for YouTube or all these various things, and watching videos on YouTube, right? Using YouTube premium. So it seems to me that even if it's a logistical answer, they're not explaining it well. And there are other ways to actually handle this. The easy of which is... Stop taking their money. And the last thing I want to leave you with is the equitable kind of concept, right? If you haven't been following this in virtual legality, you know that contracts aren't necessarily the end of this conversation, right? There are other concepts. There's a concept of unjust enrichment, right? And I'm using a law website here because a lot of the times they are better explainers of this than the statutes themselves. It says, what is unjust enrichment? Stated simply, Unjust enrichment is a claim that is based on the idea that the defendant, the breaching party, has somehow gained an advantage by virtue of their conduct and that this has led to a fundamentally unfair situation. If the court were to allow the defendant to keep this advantage, usually in the form of obtained assets, here money, then it would not only deprive you, the plaintiff, the Twitter user, of the value of such assets, you lost your money, but it would also give the defendant an unearned and unjustifiable benefit. Now, this isn't really statutory necessarily. This isn't really within the four corners of the contract document. In fact, it has to be the case that no express contract exists in most instances. Now, you'll usually see this pled in the alternative, hey, we're going to fight over whether a contract exists. And here, there is probably a legitimate dispute, right? When the Twitter user gets suspended, then all of this stuff should stop, right? This agreement basically shouldn't hold water anymore because it's been terminated. 
You're not accessing YouTube premium anymore. It all goes away. And so if you're then keeping money on a contract that shouldn't exist by virtue of the fact that you're terminating my access to everything, then let's talk about unjust enrichment. Now, from my eyes, you don't have to stop there. There's all sorts of equitable principles you can bring. But the one that I am most interested in, having watched YouTube and these big tech giants operate now for a number of years, is the concept of good faith and fair dealing. We've brought this up in a number of instances. I'm going to read to you from the potential jury instructions to a California jury on this concept. But the most important thing to remember is that even if you can play games with a contract, you've written it in a very clever way and the one side thinks that they're signing something that gives them certain rights or makes you obligated in certain fashions and you've written it and you say, ha ha, I'm going to be able to turn this on and I'm going to say, hey, look at my clever wordplay or logic puzzle approach to contracts. The law isn't going to like that. A contract only exists with a true meeting of the minds where the parties understand the rights and obligations that they are exchanging with each other. And it is effectively illegal to play games with the ambiguities around the sides of your agreement in a way that a court will deem a breach of good faith and fair dealing. And why do I think this is applicable here? As I've said, YouTube controls the ability to suspend your account. They control the ability to find a copyright infringement. They control the ability to terminate you for basically no reason. Some of the reasons that they give are effectively, it could harm YouTube to have you associated with our brand, right? If we look at this, one of these reasons is we can, denote, we can terminate you if we reasonably believe that there's been some conduct that creates liability or harm to anybody, including YouTube. Liability, hey, Maybe you can cause us some damages and now we can take action against you. It doesn't really even have to be something that we agree is a liability. It's all in YouTube's mind as long as they aren't acting capriciously and that's going to be a tough standard to meet. So since they can do that, they could honestly just start targeting premium subscribers or other subscribers to their paid services and say, hmm, maybe we take a slightly more strict approach to the way we enforce our rules because at bare minimum, it's going to take them a little while in order to get out of paying us money. And we don't have to provide that bandwidth. We don't have to provide those services. And we can proceed from there. I promised you I'd read you these jury instructions to talk about good faith and fair dealing a little bit. It says, in every contract or agreement, there is an implied promise of good faith and fair dealing. This implied promise means that each party will not do anything to unfairly interfere with the right of any other party to receive the benefits of that contract. Good faith means honesty of purpose without any intention to mislead or to take unfair advantage of another. Generally speaking, it means being faithful to one's duty or obligation. However, the implied promise of good faith and fair dealing cannot create obligations that are inconsistent with the terms of the contract, right? Nobody can look at the contract and say, well, actually YouTube owes me $500,000 and that would be what good faith is to me. Now, what YouTube owes you in the documents that we've looked at is access to the thing that you paid for. And they don't necessarily owe you a refund if you go to ask for your money back during the time in which you were suspended. But if they take more money from you and don't provide that service, we start to look at things like unjust enrichment. We start to look at things like a breach of good faith and fair dealing. And I think at the end of the day, when we talk about this, YouTube knows this, right? Because not only did they get the ratio that we saw here in these various things, right? We got 985 retweets, 308 comments, 72 likes. I really don't know who's liking that uh, from YouTube, but that's fair. Then we get YouTube a few hours later, I think, saying, whoa, hey, tweeting back. And uh, we're sorry for the frustration. We didn't, we didn't mean to say all that, not publicly, not online. Mind following us so we can share the next step via DM? It's unclear here. Team YouTube does this a lot, certainly if there's going to be personal information exchanged. But it's unclear to me why Team YouTube doesn't go and say, hey, Let's fix this right now in public because you're certainly taking the consternation, the negativity in public and you're taking it from Virtual Legality, which of course is a YouTube channel. So YouTube is very likely to look askance at this, not very likely to keep it uh, very highly thought of uh, on its service. So if you like these conversations and, and God, I like being a content creator on YouTube. I think they do a lot right, but my goodness, do they do a lot wrong? And I think they definitely stepped in it today, regardless of how you feel about this person or suspensions in general. You can't take this step to just say all your money belongs to us. 
But if you do like these conversations, please consider supporting us, supporting us on Patreon. We are having business and law discussions of pop culture, technology, software, video games, everything really in this space. If you like what you heard, please do consider supporting us. We've got tiers. We've got a description in this video. Otherwise, just subscribing, telling your friends, ringing bells, upvotes, downvotes, telling YouTube we're here because I have a feeling YouTube isn't going to like this video very much. Every single little bit helps. Now, if you did catch it on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it, in podcast form. Thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you, you know, if I'm still around on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel. 